Okay, we're back. Um, so this is, we're going to be talking about chapter one, or unit one, part two. I'm going to try to break this up into some smaller parts because I didn't realize how much I talked last time. So um, you should have seen where I posted about um, checking your own ecological footprint. And uh, there's another little video just about ecological footprints. But basically, you know, think about a footprint. It's something that, you know, when you're walking like in the sand or something, you leave an imprint of yourself and you've changed the ground. I mean, that sort of footprint can change and wash away and, and be gone. And I mean, technically, um, our own ecological footprints could eventually wash away and, and be gone. Um, and I hope that you actually did that and were maybe surprised or maybe not surprised about how much of an impact you personally have on the planet and if everyone acted the same way as you or I did um, how how kind of much we would need how many resources we would need to support us so um, let's look here at this um, diagram really quick um, about the total ecological footprint um, so look here oops here's us um, People in the United States are kind of using about 25% of, of our share. Um, and we're not, people in the United States don't make up 25% of, of the people on Earth. Um, take a look here how much we use per person. So we in America consume a great deal, use a lot of these um, plastics and single use items and make a lot of garbage and are constantly using electricity. I'm using it right now. Although, to be a little bit helpful, I am not. Um, I don't have any of my lights on. I've got enough light coming from the background, which I know isn't the best place for it to come from when you're recording. But, yeah. um, And take a look at, just for any, another example, just so you can kind of get an idea of how this data is organized. Take a look at Japan. Um, they're not using a huge share, apparently, but per person, they are consuming a lot. So they, they like to consume products like America. So, um, as you can see here, oops, in like the late 80s, early 90s, we sort of surpassed the, uh, the amount of, of natural resources we are taking from the earth that we are putting back. So that was kind of like a tipping point, a point that we reached that it's like, oh, we're now taking more than we can sustain. Um, we're producing and making and cutting and drilling and, and taking and it's not going to be able to replenish itself. Our footprint is now so deep that it's not going to be able to be easily washed away and, and replenished. Um, so we need to get on this sort of path where we are producing less and producing things in a more economically and ecologically friendly way um, that we are living sustainably, at least somewhere under, so we don't use more than one Earth, because guess what? There's literally only one Earth, so this is not sustainable. There's not two Earths worth of, worth of resources, um, but that's the path we seem to be on right now, and when, I mean, we're, we're here, so this, this graph is actually taken from an older edition. We might not be all the way up here, but um, we're not we're not really on a great path, and um, the the scary thing is if if you like to scare yourself and read scary things, if we keep going on this path, there's going to be some major ecological changes that won't be good for anybody. Um, that's why I'm really glad you're taking this course and and trying to think about these things. Um, and we already looked at this, so um, let's take a look at the the Earth as a whole, um, and where you can see the the lighter color there's areas where people are living in a sustainable manner where they're not kind of taking more than the earth can handle and anywhere that's red um they're living beyond their sustainable means and you can see where it's a lot of population centers like um, in the midwest the northeast here and the, the south and the southeast um look at europe i know people want to um use Europe as a model for different things, but they are also not living sustainably. India, areas of China and Japan are not living sustainably. Um, unfortunately, it seems that coming with advances in technology um, and medicine, 
we also are living beyond our means because that, that also generates a middle class and wealth and people want to consume products. And the production of those products causes the degradation of our environment. So um, ecological footprint is one way to measure environmental impact. This is another way. So the environmental impact um, you can measure by population times affluence, like amount of money and things people have, and technology. And let me just show you, and we'll look at it bigger here, how that can kind of work. Um, so in less developed countries, you have larger populations. People are having more children. Um, and you have just higher population centers. Well, if they're a left, less developed nation, most people are consuming less because the they're, they're not as affluent in a, in a more developed nation. Is that they don't have enough mo a, a lot of money to spend on stuff, on stuff. Um, and maybe they have uh, a more sustainable life because they can't afford to just go to the grocery store and buy Takis and um, Arizona diet green tea with ginseng um, and other items. So um, there's, there's a lot less consumption, which is, you know, positive and negative. Um, there's also not necessarily access to technology like there is in a more developed nation. So the problem is they might need to use things like um, coal and oil, um, and, and the tech technology has less of an impact to um, push that, that impact down on the environment. So their environmental impact might look like something like this. But if you notice here, in a more developed nation, it's, it might be exactly the same. Um, we might have less um, children, so more developed nations, it, it tends to be that people have smaller families. Um, but there's more affluence per person, so people have more, more money per person. Um, and you can see people want bigger houses. Uh, gosh, since I've been alive, I like, I'm like, this is a mansion, and that's just somebody's regular house. Um, so people are, are building and, and wanting larger and larger homes, larger cars, more cars. People are driving more. They want more stuff. Um, however, to go along with that, we have better access to technology. So maybe um, hybrid vehicles, wind power, things that are going to decrease our environmental impact. So we have more access to technology that can bring that number down. But our environmental impact might end up being the same. Um, so that's just another way to measure, it, similar to the ecological footprint, our impact on the environment. So I'm not going to go too much into detail on this because you can read this in, um, in your book. But for example, um, uh, China has a growing middle class, a, a, a growing population. Um, and so they're um, a huge consumer of different goods and services. Um, and the, the problem to go along with that is if you look back in like the 90s, we sort of um, changed the way we do things and the manufacturing base moved away from America. And there's a lot of manufacturing of different goods in China now. And the problem with that is manufacturing some of these goods that are made with like plastics and things, um, that produces a lot of toxic chemicals in the form of air pollution and water pollution. Two thirds of the most polluted cities are in China. Um, like uh, uh, just these different areas here, they produce so many different chemicals. Uh, it's since you have the computer right in front of you, I encourage you to look up just China air pollution. Look up any articles that you see. Look at the impact of um, the COVID-19 virus on um, the decrease of pollution in China. Um, I'd like you to just look at pictures so you can see what people in this part of the world have to deal with. Uh, and then you can read the projections for the next decade. They're going to be, um, they're going to want to import tons and tons of wheat and food to their nation. Um, a lot of areas in China aren't suitable for farming because there's deserts and mountains there. Um, and, and many, many, many people live into the, in these large cities. So there's like less farming. Um, I encourage you to just read that par portion in your book about this case study so you can kind of get a better idea. Um, natural systems have tipping points. And I kind of talked about that when, um, when we looked at sustainability. So what's an ecological tipping point? It's an often irreversible shift in the behavior of a natural system. So um, in, we'll just read through this and I'll kind of give you an example. Environmental degradation is time delays between our actions now 
and the deleterious the negative effects later. So long-term climate change, overfishing, species extinction. So like people are fishing now. I mean, they, they're, they're fishing, but they don't realize, well, we're removing so many fish that the, the population as a whole, even though it might be very large, um, we're decreasing it to a point, there's going to be a tipping point where we have fished so much that that population of fish can no longer reproduce enough to to increase their population numbers again, even if at that point they stopped fishing. So there is going to be a point where we literally overfish the ocean. Um, so in, I've seen documents where in the 1980s people um, in these different oil companies and coal companies have known about the effects of climate change, but have done nothing to stop it. So it's hard to see, you know, gosh, now 40 years ago, probably for them, oh, well, that's far off in the future, or, oh, well, I don't see any of the effects now, or, oh, maybe we'll get like, you know, a degree or something warmer. That's not really that big a deal. So there's been a delay in the time that we see, like, we've reached this tipping point to the point of, uh oh, now we can't fix it. Um, for example, if you are um, cutting down trees in a forested area, there's going to come a point where you cut down so many trees, even if you replace them as saplings, um, there's not going to be enough room or, or, or habitats for the different birds and animals and bugs and things that live there to the point that you cannot support that species in that area anymore. And it might come after, like several years after, because those animals aren't going to just be like, well, there's not enough space. They're going to try to live. Um, and then all of a sudden we're going to be like, oh, well, there's only four of this type of owl left in the world. That's how we get to that point, um, because there's this delay. So this is just the illustration of a tipping point. It's like you can imagine we're pushing the environment, pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, and you're like, okay, well, once we get to this point, there's kind of no stopping this free fall that's going to happen to the environmental system that you're talking about. Um, and that's what scientists are really, really, really trying to warn people about now uh, with climate change. They're scared we're going to reach this tipping point in the environment and we're going to see this cascade of changes that are irreversible. That's why we need to like care and do things now. So let's, let's do that. Um, so cultural changes have shifted our ecological footprints. And we'll kind of go through a little bit of change in time. So 12,000 years ago, people were mostly hunter-gatherers. I love reading like books and different things. Um, some people think that there were human civilizations, that there were cities about that time, 12, 10,000, 12,000 years ago. Some people argue that that's not, not possible or that wasn't happening. Who knows? We weren't around. Um, a lot of stuff gets destroyed in 10,000 years. So... Um, but anyway, for the most part, that's probably true. We were hunters and gatherers 12,000 years ago. Um, and then we've experienced really three major cultural events that have increased our ecological footprint. Um, the first thing was the agricultural revolution, the discovery and implementation of large-scale farming to support people. People then didn't need to be hunters and gatherers. They're like, oh, well, instead of hunting this food, we'll just raise these animals and then kill them when we want meat. And then we'll just, we'll take care of them ourselves. Um, or well, I don't have to wander around the whole country looking for like this whole region that I live in looking for fruits that are good to eat and ripe. I can grow them myself and then I can store them. Um, so you had farms and then you had towns and silly cities develop around these farming. Um, then there is the industrial revolution and like the medical revolution. Those happen very close in time to each other. So we can kind of put them together. Um, so we had the development of machines to sort of take over this laborious work that made it um, happen much faster and more efficient. And then the medical revolution where we had the advent of different medicines and vaccines and, um, and so people could live longer or live outside of childhood. So that in dramatically increased the Earth's population. And we're in one right now, the information and globalization revolution, where you can, like it used to be the world you could imagine was the size of the globe, now the world is the size of your little mouse pad. Like you can be talking to or interacting with someone on another part of the of the entire world instantly now. Um, and it wasn't 
I mean, that's very, very new. So we're sort of in the middle of that and sort of trying to navigate this new cultural revolution. Even though it might not seem like we are, we kind of are. And we're actually desperately in need for a sustainability revolution. And if that doesn't happen soon, we're going to overuse our resources like I've been talking about. Like you can see from doing that little ecological footprint quiz that I posted on Google Classroom for you. Um, we desperately need that. We need to develop technologies that are going to let us live sustainably and and it's going to be hard for some people because we are going to have to consume less um, and maybe buy less corporations are going to need to produce less which they don't necessarily want to do because they make money and it's hard to say well stop making money or make less and deal with it so um, there's going to need to be another major cultural shift and it's going to have to happen in our lifetimes um, technology increases population do I have this twice yes I do um, water it's good for you so um, population has just basically increased over time and the addition of new technologies is going to increase population um, that's just what is illustrated by this graph here so we're going to kind of wrap up 1.3 here um, why do we have environmental problems well you can kind of read this but I'll read it to you. So major causes of environmental problems are population growth, I would say out of out of control population growth, wasteful and unsustainable resource use. So when you charge your phone, we don't think, I don't think, I, I need to start doing that more, but we don't think about where that energy comes from. You're just like, oh, my phone's at like 9%. I gotta charge my phone. Um, you don't think about where that comes from or, oh, you know, I put my apple in a plastic bag. I'll just throw it out and get a new one. It's wasteful, it's, and it's unsustainable. We have to stop doing things like that. Um, poverty, hmm, that's like a big problem. Um, and exclusion of environmental costs of a resource. What does that mean? Exclusion of environmental costs. So think about what that could mean. A corporation doesn't feel the environmental effects. So yeah, they're there like, you know, mining an area. They don't feel the effects of the loss of species or the, the rerouting of a river, um, or the damming of a river that causes like the animals and fish and plants around there to die out. The, co the company doesn't feel that. We do. The whole world does. Um, so this is why we have environmental problems. So there's a lot of issues that we have to tackle. Some are going to be very, very, very hard that I don't have the answer to. Um, so I think smart people don't have the answer to either. Um, so experts have, like I said, identified four basic causes of environmental problems. Population growth, I would like to put in there out of control population growth. Um, because in certain areas, yeah, you, 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 like if you have uh, like a mommy and daddy, like to replace them to keep the population the same, they would need to have how many kids? How many of them are there too? So if you have a, a family, Mom and dad, they have two kids. They've just replaced themselves. Um, you have some areas where there's um, not really well understood, like like they don't kind of teach people about having children and, and that sort of thing, and they just have children. They have like six, seven, eight kids, um, and that's not sustainable. Um, it's not saying don't have kids or anything like that. That's not an argument I'm trying to make right now, but um, there's like, I would think a, maybe potentially a lack of knowledge of of um, family planning. Um, again, the wasteful and unsustainable resource use, poverty, and then the fact that environmental costs are not put in the cost of our goods and services. So here you go. Here's a picture of all that if you want to kind of get an idea. Um, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to kind of stop this here for now because I feel like I could make this a long video, but I think it's easier for you guys to take things into like little bits and pieces and, and watch them and maybe read and kind of digest and maybe watching the whole long video or just seeing like it's, hey, it's a long video. You might be like, I'm not, I can't watch all that right now. But um, what I would encourage you to do is if a video does seem long, watch part of it, look at the book, walk away, do whatever you got to do, and then come back. Okay, that's why I make these. Um, so you can kind of get an idea and, and watch it at your own pace. 
Okay, but um, I hope that helps for at least this little part to kind of break down what you are reading about and help you understand. Um, like I said, I just really encourage you to read the book um, and go along with that so you can kind of get an idea of, of what it's saying and maybe make it easier to digest. Okay, um, bye. I'll see you very soon.